Hi, this is Curtis Elmore from FloridaMarijuana.net. We are here today with the Marijuana Solutions Vodcast, and we have a very special guest, Alexander Knackman here from First Harvest Financial. And today he's going to be sharing with us his philosophy about the situation here in Florida and his ideas about opportunities that there may be out there for people to start businesses. So without further ado, let's get into his podcast here. You know, basically, I, I'm out there in an effort to communicate um, about the plant in, in a very uh, upfront and truthful manner. Um, you know, you can put yourself at great personal risk uh, talking about these type of things. Um, and it's fine because I know that I'm talking in the direction of truth and love. I know that uh, plant-based medicine works, uh, even though the, the government tells us that it's not medicine, but then they own the rights to the medicine, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, look, that was put into law in 1999 by President Clinton in the Health and Human Services. It's patent number 6630507. Hey, you know, there's files that I have that are 20 years old that I'm sure I lost. Um, I can understand with it, you know, almost 20 years ago that they might have misplaced the memo, but I'm here to remind them that it's absolutely medicine, that they own the medicine for uh, the, the, the fact of antioxidants and neuroprotectants. Um, antioxidants are obviously good for your body and uh, neuroprotectants protect your brain. So stuff like Parkinson's and epilepsy and Alzheimer's are all very positively affected uh, by the use of cannabis. This we know, um, but people are still horribly uneducated to that fact. You would think that um, knowing that, that the government lies right to our face would be enough for everybody to want to upset the apple cart. But unfortunately, we've gotten sadly sickened um, or well-adjusted -adjust, to the profoundly sick society uh, in which we've accepted that the government lies to us. And it's just like, oh, yeah, you know, that's like Saturday. Oh, good. Good. Right. Saturday comes after Friday. So that it is what it is. Um, the problem is, is there's, you know, plenty of sick people that would benefit from plant based medicine. And furthermore, I came to the industry um, from an economic standpoint. I, I'm a finance guy. Uh, I spent 14 years on Wall Street. And, you know, I, I, I very much realize the economic upside. Mm -hmm. uh, Number one, there's taxation, which would create a whole brand new stream of revenues, not increasing the individual um, income tax, but basically a tax based on consumption that would create, you know, millions of dollars um, for the nation. Colorado, I believe, generated one hundred nine million dollars last year in tax revenues, uh, more than they actually even benefit uh, imagined would be possible. Right. Uh, so there's the tax revenue angle, which is great. And now we have, you know, nine locations nationwide, including Washington, D.C., that will start to showcase the positive benefits from an economic standpoint. Um, furthermore, we spend fifty one billion dollars on the war on drugs uh, right now, a war that we're not winning and is not working. Um, meanwhile, you know, all illegal drugs combined in this country um, kill 321 people a week. <laughs> Prescri prescription pills kill 442 people a week. Mm. And uh, alcohol and alcohol related deaths kill 1,692 people a week. Wow. Yeah. To put that in perspective for you, um, Alcohol and alcohol related deaths is the number one killer of our people uh, between ages 15 and 59, and it surpassed AIDS for that title. Hmm. Well, and of course, you just lumped all other drugs in with marijuana as well, which once you filter those out, the marijuana numbers go to practically nil. The cannabis kills zero is absolutely correct. Um, and, you know, they take it and they lump it with everything else. But cigarettes kill 400,000 people, Americans every year. You're allowed to wave those around like a Statue of Liberty. You can go to the pool and, and be father of the year, have 12 beers and, you know, be half in the bag while your kid is, you know, flailing around in the pool. Right. Uh, but God forbid you, you, you ingest a little cannabis in the privacy of your own home before you go go to the pool. 
it's it's just a bunch of farce. But getting back to the economics of the thing, um, you know, you've got tax revenues that can be created. You've got nonviolent offenders that are in jail. There's approximately 700,000 uh, nonviolent marijuana offenders in jail right now. Um, the prices of incarceration range from $25,000 in Florida for incarceration uh, up to about $167,000 a year in like New York State. Um, it's unbelievable, but if you just did the numbers at let's say 50,000 average, I mean, you know, I think the number would come out to about 35 billion uh, based on 700,000 nonviolent offenders being in jail. And it's a lot of zeros. And, you know, there'll be a, a number that we wouldn't have to deal with paying that tab anymore. Now, meanwhile, I think we could put, put the money saved from those type of dollars into work programs, uh, agriculture programs, have people farming hemp. Hemp, as we all know, is a huge economic win. And it creates stuff like plastics and, you know, textiles. Um, certainly medicine can be made from hemp. Food products can be made from hemp and even, you know, fuel can be made from hemp. So, again, it's another big economic win when you couple that with, let's say, something like uh, Medicare and Medicaid. It's estimated that four hundred and sixty eight million dollars would be saved uh, in Medicare and Medicaid if the plant was um, legalized nationwide. Where does that money come from? It comes from the savings off of the prescription drug use. Um, it, a decline in prescription drug use, these things are very expensive. It doesn't tax the system as greatly because plant-based medicine is much more affordable. Uh -huh. And then there's also the reduction in the law enforcement spending. Right. The eradication of basically mar marijuana um, eradication grants, drug eradication grants, and different things of this nature, they can divert their resources elsewhere. Um, let alone their, their funds. And, you know, I'm not saying necessarily uh, get rid of funding, you know, obviously we want to fund our, our security forces, sure. but I think we want to allocate the funds in a different way. I think we want to train them up in a different way and have their target be differently. Um, back in 1937, really, um, marijuana became uh, you know, some sort of scary topic in which it gave the, the police the random reason to pat down truly the, the African-Americans and the Latinos, what what they referred to as at the time was the jazz musicians and the darkies. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you cannot even begin to spew the type of rhetoric today that was used back in the 1930s. And unfortunately, that random reason to pat, pat them down has now created a social divide um, so wide and so deep that I can't even see the bottom, let alone the other side. And 57% um, greater incarceration rate of the African male, uh, male uh, and Latino male versus uh, their white counterparts, even though they sell drugs at, at let's say, the same rate. Mm -hmm. It's similar. So it's horribly unjust. But really, again, if somebody's smoking a marijuana cigarette, and I'll use the word cigarette, what are they doing? They're not doing anything. Yeah, they're just a little bit of ingestion. Right. And I don't personally care um, if you're on the on the corner drinking whatever type of 40 you want, smoking whatever type of cigarette you want. Um, I'd prefer to kind of end the war on drugs as we know it and declare a war on violence. And when, when people are starting to act untoward or somebody's beating up on somebody else or stopping them from going somewhere and impeding their individual freedoms as an American, that's when I think we should intervene. Right. Well, yeah, and I think people are starting to realize that it's you could you could call it a thought crime, but it's not even a thought crime because you don't have to manifest any negative thoughts. It's sort of a state of mind crime, as in they believe that you will have some increased propensity to commit some other already illegal act if you are under the influence of drugs or, you know, marijuana. But that's absurd. I think we're beginning to realize that in large numbers. It's it's absolutely absurd. And I've heard every time. Uh, one of the other things is I was a, a philosophy and a finance major. Um, 
I, I refer to myself as a logistical nightmare. And the, the fact <laughs> is I have heard every type of fallacy and cognitive distortion with regards to the um, legalization of marijuana. I've yet to hear one valid argument against. And, you know, they use this emotional reasoning. Oh, well, if people are out there and they're all potted up and they're driving. Well, you know, one third of all traffic fatalities in this country are caused by alcohol. Um, we couldn't do much worse. That puts that number at north of 50,000. We couldn't do much worse. Quite frankly, marijuana affects your brain a lot differently than alcohol um, and doesn't turn off the synapses in your brain, receptors in your brain that affect your heart and lungs, which is why you don't die from it. Uh, <laughs> But it plain and simply affects you differently. But we're worried about driving on a little weed versus everyone's driving on a ton of alcohol. And it's a great killer of our people. It's it, again, there's you can say, uh, you know, I heard the story. Oh, my son was on marijuana and he killed himself. Oh, well, you know, I'm very sorry that that occurred. It's never nice for to lose a loved one. Turns out, though, that the loved one was also on alcohol. They were fiddling with meth. They were doing cocaine. They had tried heroin. They were on six different things. Well, of course, it was marijuana. He started with marijuana and it, and it all came about from there. Yeah, see, that's not that's not going to hold mustard with a good philosopher. And the fact is, is that if you're going to argue in that type of causal relations, I'm going to tell you that it all started with milk. Right. It, you're going to find the suicide rates of those who ingested milk grew much higher 100%. than those who ever even tried marijuana. Right. And you know, he progressed to worse things from milk mm -hmm. and you can't draw the corollary. And it's very unfortunate, but marijuana is not making anybody do anything. Mm. Um, just just like um, he, a, any decision that we all make, we have to kind of be personally responsible for our actions. Absolutely. And there's always going to be a few bad apples, but I've seen case after case and I've spoken with with a friend of mine and other law enforcement people um, throughout the, the last couple of years that says that alcohol is a much bigger problem, much more crime goes down on alcohol, um, more uh, untoward and violent style behavior occurs on alcohol. And by by far and large, you know, the, the marijuana offender kind of just wants to be left alone, wasn't really doing much. Um, and, you know, hey, even though it's a proverbial joke, they want to sit at home, you know, watch Netflix and order a pizza. I mean, you know, listen to music, hang out with their friends. Um, you know, there's always a, a risk of abuse, um, but I think it's nominal compared to the type of effect that cigarettes and alcohol are having right now. First Harvest Financial is the leading source for the legal medical cannabis industry. The cannabis opportunity is budding right now, so visit firstharvestfinancial.com. Well, I originally came from an economic opportunity. Um, at a very young age, um, I realized that that I think that this product was going to have benefits and was being outlawed for no good reason, but had plenty of upside. And I felt that eventually it, it would be approved. Hey, you know, at the time there was only four states um, and then plus Washington, D.C. that had recreational marijuana. So 90 percent of the country hadn't adopted the commercial business model, as I'll refer to it. And at that time, only 23 states had medical laws. Meanwhile, the five most dangerous words on Wall Street are this time it is different. <laughs> OK. And it never is different. And here's a product that had a $50 billion illicit market and was not being unearthed and taken advantage of from that level. I was an early adopter to DVD players. And I used to buy chips and DVD players as a stockbroker before anybody knew what a DVD player was, let alone had one. And I had no idea how many people would buy a DVD player. And I just knew it was a lot better than the CD, CDs and a lot better than the VCR, okay, uh, or VHS. 
Well, of course, you know, everybody ended up getting a DVD player. And at this point, we've evolved to Netflix and Blu-ray and a couple of other things. But it followed the typical um, product adoption cycle. I just didn't know how large the market would be. Well, here's cannabis with a $50 billion illegal market. I know people are buying it. They just happen to be buying it illegally. And instead of the government being the beneficiary of that, you know, you have instead um, basically terrorists, drug cartels, uh, organized criminals and wannabe gangsters benefiting from prohibition. I'm not in favor of funding those style organizations. And I much rather the money go back into American infrastructure, American job creation, um, education and things of this nature. Um, so for me, it's a natural fit. I understand the numbers and the economics of the savings. I understand the upside of the business model. I mean, another industry that, that I made a lot of money in was the defibrillator market. And it's not really that sexy, but the reason that went bananas is because at some point they made it a, a law that all the municipalities and the stadiums had to have a certain amount of defibrillators in-house. As soon as they made it the law and the law changed, the revenues to those style companies went up exponentially and there was a huge profits to be had. In this industry, I'd like to see the plant uh, legalized nationwide, first of all, just on the fact that it's medicine alone. And I'm not looking to necessarily make money off somebody's medicine. However, the way that Wall Street works is you have companies like um, Zenerba, uh, Z-Y-N-E, that does a transdermal patch that de delivers medicine directly to the source. Well, it was very novel. There's a value to it, just like any other drug delivery system. And they'll do well over time if they you know, continue to get their numbers together. I'm not into necessarily saying, oh, this is how we're going to make all this money because money is not that important to me. The American people are important to me. Uh, I trust me. I, I love making business and I love making deals and I, I like making money and you know. But for me, the economics of this, the hatred, lies, and bigotry, the fact that it serves from as medicine for millions of people, um, is my primary motivation. Mm -hmm. Well, that's certainly noble. But I, I know you realize the 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 connection between the financial rewards and the service that you provide people. I mean, if you offer people a, a service or a product and it goes like gangbuster it's it's because there's a need out there and you'll for, you're fulfilling that need and so you're helping uh, you know it's okay that you make a profit because you know your time has to be directed through some sort of financial incentive or otherwise you're not taking care of yourself and if you don't take care of yourself you can't help anybody else so uh, you know, it's a it's a nice clean loop as far as I'm concerned from uh, from helping people to the profits. So. Yeah. And there's a lot of things that I can be fully in support of while, you know, while supporting a safe and responsible market. I personally feel that there's nothing safe and responsible about a prohib prohibitive market. Um, you know, sometimes a kid shows up to a drug deal. He brings money. The other kid brings guns. And sometimes, right. unfortunately, you know, the one kid loses more than his money. Uh, grandma would be much safer buying her medicine at the CVS than behind the train tracks. Absolutely. Funding organizations such as, you know, uh, drug cartels and terrorist organizations and, um, you know, uh, organized criminals is, is certainly not safe or responsible. Uh, age verification is. So age verification software and stuff like this is very responsible um, and something that the industry can fund to build out a safe and responsible industry. Seed to sale software so we can track exactly who had the plan, you know, and that it came from a reliable source and that it was, you know, nurtured um, and just didn't come off the black market so that they can sneak in and make money. Um, so that's a type of thing that's important. Another thing that is really important and I'm fully in support of is, and I don't know anybody that isn't, but laboratory testing. Right. So that we can identify what the various components are in the medicine, how strong it is, allow the doctors kind of a flow chart from a dosing standpoint. There's really, we're only 
touching the tip of the iceberg in terms of cannabis and its components. You know, you mentioned the seed to sale connection uh, as a safety issue, but how do you think that that will impact the financial aspect and the proliferation of the availability of the drugs? Well, you know, I'm for, you know, obviously opening up, you know, mainstream and allowing for a a large amount of growers to have access to it, which I believe will reduce the cost of the plant overall. Implementing various fail safes will then back increase the, the cost of the plant, but I think it'll be, it'll kind of equalize over time. In the beginning, um, yeah, look, you know, laboratory testing costs have gone way up, you know, for in places like Oregon, because they've adopted a very stringent standard. And, you know, Oregon lost a lot of laboratory testing outfits um, because a lot of them didn't pass the grade. Um, So testing has gone to an increased price. Well, in time, as more labs come online, it'll it'll decrease again. Um, But it's something that needs to be done. And quite frankly, even the growers Although they're paying more, they want to showcase that they're not cheating, okay? And they also want to showcase the quality of their product and, you know, its contents. Now, just saying that laboratory testing is a great way to get involved in the industry and an absolute necessity. And it's it's for the benefit of the patients, the doctors, the growers, and the dispensaries, and even the lawmakers that can point to a safe and responsible re- re- regulatory structure. It's something that I'm really in support of. Okay. okay. So, so tell, tell me what, what angle are you, are you taking here? here? You've, You've got, got a website, website that's, that's dedicated, dedicated to this new industry, industry right? right? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, I have a WordPress, Alexander Knackman, uh, dot WordPress. I have my own website. It's alexandernackman.com. Um, you know, again, I'm interested in getting the story out um, and proliferating the news. I am interested in the financial standpoint. And, you know, I, I connect people all the time and look to, to make deals. Um, I look to make them in, in a way that is safe as, and responsible and, you know, lighting, you know, a lot of the ancillary products, you know, are of interest. Lighting, laboratories, seed to sale, um, age verification and security, the, these type of things I would invest in with regards to marijuana. You'll never catch me trying to buy um, the next vaporizer company because I just don't know what's the best one. And even if they're the best one today, I don't know if they'll be the best one, you know, a year from now. I mean, I think everybody remembers when the StarTac was the hottest new phone. <laughs> um, yeah, it kind of seems silly now, right? And then it was the BlackBerry. The and then phone. The, right, yeah. And so there's always going to be something coming along next. And that's the part of that product adoption uh, cycle that I talked about is, you know, it ramps up, it's an adoption of the product, and then usually something newer or better comes along. Cannabis won't have that in general, in general cannabis terms, because first of all, good market, bad market, people drink, good market, bad market, people will smoke. And they're already ingesting $50 billion worth of product nationwide. If it goes nationwide legal, I don't suspect that they'll use less. Right. If anything, they make to using a little bit more marijuana. And, you know, it's all these things combined when, when you think about it. So, so you, you think, think that, that there, there might be some opportunity in the ancillary businesses, businesses that surround the vertical integration companies? companies. Absolutely. I just wouldn't try to go pick the random one. Like, for instance, I like rolling papers, you know, um, rolling papers is a great business. And the fact is, is it's the blue jeans of the industry. You know, it doesn't matter what fashion does. Everybody will still always wear blue jeans. Okay. Rolling papers, you know, 50% of the the world rolls their own cigarettes, first of all. And second of all, um, you know, people will always smoke joints. Um, But, you know, in terms of like the new technology, the new vaporizer, I don't know. Oh, these coils, they burn out. These, they don't. There's always something going on and somebody's always building a better mousetrap. So trying to pick and choose in that way is difficult. But 
betting on medicine and delivery systems or betting on, you know, laboratory testing, which will be undoubtedly a staple and be something that'll be rock solid in around 50 years from now, Mm -hmm. because the testing is going to get more stringent. You can't go look, the testing for medical is a very good reason to argue for it. But the fact is, is that there's a lot more people that aren't sick and you can't walk into a a liquor store in America and pick up a bottle of Jack Daniels and not know how strong it is and what exactly is in it. But forgetting all that, because that's available to the 21 year, year old and older consumer, you can't go into the grocery store right now and pick up a chocolate bar and not know what's in it. So labeling is going to be extraordinarily important because if we're going to have it available commercially for sale, recreationally for everybody that's 21 year old or older, we want to know how strong it is, how it's going to affect them, the various qualities. And if it's a chocolate bar, if it's 50 grams, we want to see the instructions to only eat a quarter of the bar and then see you know, how you feel in a, in a half hour. Mm-hmm. So, so you, you, you feel, feel like the whatever slowdown the industry might meet with due to the various testings and labeling, <clears throat> that that is just a necessary part of the growth cycle and, and actually adds to everything overall. Uh, is that right? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think in time as the market continues to grow, there'll be opportunities of all sorts. You know, some people want to start up a dispensary. I don't I don't necessarily have the desire to run a dispensary, but if if you need, let's say, lighting in order to grow plant indoors, that might be an area that I would be interested in looking at. And one could argue, well, these lights versus these lights, and then there's the next set of lights coming on. Well, if you get with a very well-established, innovative lighting company, not only are they going to have all the different types, but they're going to be looking at the new the new styles that are in development. And you try to stick with one of the larger companies and more more established companies. Not that somebody couldn't come out of nowhere and develop something special. I just look to try to develop uh, a relationship with the more established companies in the industry. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like you feel like the the core of the industry that is definitely always going to be there, like you said, things like lights and maybe uh, fertilizer or even delivery of finished product, um, security, uh, these types of things which we know all the vertical integration companies will have to have at some point um, are definitely going to grow as the industry balloons. First Harvest Financial is the leading source for the legal, medical, cannabis industry. The cannabis opportunity is budding right now, so visit firstharvestfinancial.com. So how does your does your website help this and further the cause here? My website's not about, you know, profits. Or it's basically about information. Um, I've been published on the plant about, I think, about eight times in the last year or so. Um, and, uh, you know, currently I'm writing a letter to President-elect Trump. I previously wrote a letter to President Obama. And, you know, basically I- I'm get- I'm trying to get the word out that, that the plant makes good, good economic makes great medicinal sense. Um, you know, it's steeped in hatred, lies, bigotry, and special interests, all of which I'm not in favor of. I'm against civil rights violations. I'm against human rights for violations. And, I, I, you know, I'm against medical discrimination. Yeah. And it's it's time to shift. I, I My boss is a little pissed at me because I've become more of an advocate <laughs> uh, yeah. than of a money raiser. <clears throat> but again, I'm doing fine. Um, I'm doing fine. And I'm, I'm definitely interested in doing the right thing. Yeah, it sounds like you're approaching this more from a moral standpoint and from a philosophical standpoint, like you say, than, than financial. Uh, and you realize that if you can get the word out and the information out there, then the second will follow. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And at this point, truly, you know, it's one thing to commit atrocities. It's another thing to stand idly by and do nothing about it when you're aware. And after I took the time to get involved in this industry and get educated and meet with patient groups and mothers of sick kids and, and uh, veterans and disabled people and people that are were unlawfully incarcerated for uh, lengthy periods of time, 
I, you know, I became thoroughly disgusted as I became educated. And now to sit back uh, and not put it out there and, and to make people aware, especially when they're being lied to on a regular basis by our own government, let alone other groups that are trying to manipulate the system and to not stay, you know, get out there full blown with my big voice, whether it be by pen or, or you know, my ability to uh, to speak um, would be an injustice, would be a crime. I, I would not feel good about myself. Mm. What do you think the impact of the new Amendment 2 is going to have at this point? Amendment 2 is huge. We have a lot of people to thank for Amendment 2 here in Florida. And, um, you know, the fact is, is that, you know, you got 14 qualifying conditions, which is wonderful. And it is uh, bringing full plant medicine to Florida, which is a, another huge step forward because pre previously we only had CBD. And then also the fact that there's an addendum to that that states um, any qualifying, any condition that your doctor feels uh, is debilitating enough to merit it. So this increases the size of the market exponentially and gives the opportunity for medicine to meet, reach the most amount of people. Undoubtedly, opportunities of all sorts will be popping up. Currently, we only have six growers, which certainly is not enough to service the whole state. And, you know, they're going to work on adding growers. So opportunity in the growth sector will exist. The opportunity to file and to become a dispensary owner exists. And at the same time, at these grow houses, they'll need the same old ancillary products as everybody else does. They'll need lighting. They'll need hydroponic grow systems. They'll need uh, security. And, you know, the dispensaries, they need security as well. OK, uh, they need banking. It's another huge void in the industry. Um, you know, uh, you know, all along the way, even the growers, they'll need testing. So the amount of test lab laboratory testing facilities, um, the, the amount of laboratory testing facilities in um, in Florida right now is zero. Really? Zero. Well, where do and the Florida dispensaries get tested currently? The way that the law is currently written is that the that the growers do their own testing. Hmm. Right. <laughs> so Everything like looks asking, good here. <laughs> that's not like asking the, you know, the, you know, USBA uh, bodybuilder to test his own, you know, his own blood for steroids and, or to have the government, let's say, put out their own news. Um, you know, it's 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 something that doesn't make a lot of sense. So independent laboratory testing, I think, is the way that it's going to go. And there's all sorts of opportunities now that the market is opening up. And I'm hoping that Florida heads towards a recreationally legal market. Um, you know, everybody should be out there signing Michael Minardi's uh, Regulate Florida uh, petition at regulateflorida.com, which will um, pave the way for a recreation market in 2018 and also eliminate the fact that if you have a handgun and cannabis in, in the same location that you're automatically a felon in Florida and we need to change these laws and it's one step at a time Florida would be recreationally the seventh largest market in the country and it's estimated that it would be generating 183 million dollars in tax revenues the very first year um, you know it was legal also Colorado's um, tourism market went up by three times mm. when they legalized recreational marijuana. Well, Florida is for tourism, right? Florida's tourism market's already seven times the size. Hmm. And so, you know, I think would see an enormous impact. I mean, you know, uh, the joke is, you know, go get goofy with goofy or something like this, <laughs> but you know, look, it's beautiful weather. You know, you've got these uh, older people that are vacationing here already. And quite frankly, the fact that they could have access to medicine, that they could feel good. And I, I believe it's all medicinal. The plant doesn't switch hands, you know, unless you want to say that your coffee through the week is medicinal and your coffee on the weekends is recreational. Um, you know, you cope at work. OK, the bottom line is if the plant makes you feel good, whether you, you need that feel good because you're in a depression or, hey, you just like to kind of be in a better mood. 
it, it doesn't bother me, but it, the pain relieving qualities of THC are working whether you're trying to alleviate pain or not. The appetite component is working whether you're trying to encourage your appetite or not. You know, when you ingest CBD, it is reducing swelling on your brain. So it, these, these things are happening naturally along with the other, there's 113 cannabinoids in cannabis and each of them do something. And whether you're using it because, Hey, it makes me feel good. And I'm not as groggy in the morning. You're still garnering some of those medicinal benefits. How did you learn so much about the plant itself? Um, I just took the time to read. Um, and get involved and then also associated with people, nurses and doctors and other educators you know, in the space that were very knowledgeable. And I just kind of uh, I have what I refer to as beautiful mind syndrome uh, <laughs> and I'm very maniacal. So once I start getting interested in something and I'm passionate about something, uh, I will take every available ounce of energy and, and, and throw myself into it. I'm fully committed to cannabis at this point. I'm building a legacy with the stuff that I write. I know I'm on the right side of this issue. How can people find stuff that you write? Um, all you have to do is Google Alexander Knackman. I'll come up quite a bit. And, and um, spell your last name for the people here. It's, it's N is in November, A is in Alpha, C is in Charlie, H is a hotel, M is in Mary, A is in Alpha, N is in November. So it's N-A-C-H-M-A-N, Alexander Knackman. Quite frankly, if you put in Alexander and the word cannabis in Google, it'll auto-populate the word advocate. And if you click on that, you'll be able to find access to a lot of the things I've written. Um, you find my WordPress, which actually doesn't have every single thing that I've written. But you start digging around, you'll be able to find it and if you have any problems whatsoever they can feel free to, to contact me and how would they contact you you can contact me over my professional site on facebook or the regular my regular site on facebook i'm really not hiding from anybody so e easy enough if you google me you'll be able to figure it out pretty quickly where are you based now I'm based out of um, Tampa Clearwater area down here in Florida and um, pleased to be so, uh, you know, because of the weather. But, uh, you know, I'm available via phone call or computer almost any time of the day. Wow, that's excellent. Do you have any uh, presentations or speaking engagements that uh, we can tell people about? Um, you know, I, I had one that is scheduled. I think it's for May, but I, I don't know the name of it. Unfortunately, it was scheduled a, a little while ago, but I believe that's here in Tampa. I'm looking at a, a couple of other opportunities. And of course, I'm going to continue to write. I have three or four articles um, that I have queued up for the first quarter. Uh, one is uh, the letter to President-elect Trump. That will be out on January 15th, which is the Monday previous to the inauguration. And I think it'll get a lot of press coverage. Nice. And are you developing an app as well? Um, I'm not developing personally an app. You know, I'm involved. Uh, we, uh, one of my companies I work with uh, has a video game. Um, that, that we utilize, um, you know, you know, I'm associated with the rolling paper company. Um, there's a, there's a couple of different things that I'm involved in, but what's the video um, game called? Uh, it's hemp Inc. You know, and you know, it's not illegal. Oh, this is where you get to build a, a, a business, like a virtual business, right? Yeah, and you can sell cannabis, and you you buy different strains, and you know, you, you know, there's a kind of a quasi, uh, you know, I mean, it's not real violence, but you can be stolen from. You can be stolen from because in the illegal market, you know, this is what happens. I mean, that's why it's not as safe. I mean, if it was regulated, it'd be much safer. But if anybody wants to contact me, I can throw them under NDA and um, I'm happy to showcase the laboratory testing uh, deals that I have right now. Um, they're you know, it's a $300,000 minimum. Um, so if somebody's looking to try to, oh, I'm going to get into laboratory testing, that's a great idea. Know what you're getting into. It's different than buying into a public company that does testing, um, which there really isn't anybody on the market at this point. But eventually, I think that's what happens is the private companies go public and then the, the general public has a greater access to the investment vehicle. Where do you get that $300,000 minimum from? Um, it came from basically the private placement memorandum of, of the opportunity. Um, so the $300,000 minimum is, is in order to participate in the offering. 
Um, you could do like more a bond than or something. something? Um, well, this is actually established. This particular one is established as a unit investment trust, okay. and you'd be partic participating for three hundred grand in one of the units. Um, and the particular raise that I'm looking at right now is a three million dollar raise. Okay. Now, I just would urge people to stay ed educated, to write their congressmen, you know, and, and get involved on, on a local level. Um, to, of course, remember to vote. Be on the lookout for any other petitions that might be available and to share um, pieces that they feel favorably about, whether it's content that I create or content that they learned about that that they can help educate others. Education's our best armor. OK, um, is what I say. And, and you know, uh, knowledge is power. Excellent. Well, it's been it's been a pleasure talking to you this morning. Uh, very much appreciate your, your input and your involvement. I really like to see people who are passionate about uh, the situation and, like you said, helping people out. Uh, uh, you know, I, I come from a criminal defense perspective, um, and so I've seen the, the ravages that the, the, the prohibition has just done, to, what it's done to the population. and. And um, so I, I'm very hopeful that um, with the revolution that people look at it a different way, we can cut back on the crazy law enforcement and get people back into a normal society, really, when it comes to this stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I agree 100 percent. I think we should normalize it, you know, eliminate the stigma. I mean, certainly not worse than cigarettes or alcohol, uh, which are killing, you know, basically a half a million Americans combined every single year. And then when you factor in that it could have a positive effect on the cancer market and it's being prohibited because of the massive golden goose that cancer is um, and stuff like this, the special interests and the lies, I can't deal with it. And uh, I think we need to reverse the trend. I think we need to educate people and we let, let them know the real story and then judge for themselves once they really have the information. But when the government tells us it's not medicine and, and then they own the rights to the medicine. <laughs> yeah, you know, you can't uh, do it, but we'll, we'll take your tax money, too. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And it's just wrong. I, I, I have to stand up on the side of what's right. Well, I very much appreciate it. We all appreciate it here. We thank you for your time. And uh, hopefully we'll have you back on here before too long and, uh, and, and get an update as to what's going on as, as January rolls into full swing here with the transition to Amendment 2. Yeah, so. ter terrific. I look forward to it. I appreciate the opportunity, Curtis. Thank you so much. You are aware, aware of the Star Wars solution.